More details on Michael Thomas's offseason surgery situations and an in-depth look for days eight and nine at training camp at positions of need for the New Orleans Saints, all on today's episode of Locked On Saints. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's episode, we got more information thanks to Jeff Duncan over now at NOLA.com on Michael Thomas's off-season surgery and the situation surrounding it. So we'll talk about what happened to delay the surgery and what it means next for the New Orleans Saints and Michael Thomas. Then in segments two and three, we're going to just kind of compare days eight and nine over on the offensive and defensive sides at positions of need to talk about which players have been standing out where the Saints need the most as we go on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. And as always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, co-managing editor over at CanalStreetChronicles.com, your Tuesday co-host over at the National Locked on NFL podcast. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on another bonus episode of Locked on Saints. All right, families, kicking off today's episode of Locked on Saints, we want to talk through the Michael Thomas situation. What led to the delay in the surgery for his ankle? We got more information on it today. Thanks to Jeff Duncan over at now at NOLA.com. Highly suggest checking out, read it for yourself, get all the information there and support your local paper and all of your local journalists as well. So I want to talk a little bit about just kind of give you the spark notes, if you will, around what happened. We already know, and just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, Michael Thomas was supposed to have an offseason ankle surgery, didn't have it until June. Now he's going to be out for 12 to 16 weeks, that timeline starting from where the surgery happened, which probably takes you about five, six, seven weeks into the regular season at the longest. That's kind of the longer projection up to five games is the expected uh, timeline in terms of how much. Michael Thomas could miss to open up the regular season. So how did all of this happen? We know that he had the high ankle sprain last year, tried to play through it, ended up shutting himself down for the last three games of the season to try to come back and help Drew Brees win a ring on his way out. And then we had heard from the very beginning of the offseason that surgery was likely for him, a deltoid injury, some other ligament damage, ankle, all of those things. So here's now what we know and what we learned today, thanks to Jeff Duncan over at NOLA.com. So Michael Thomas met with team doctors after the season, and team doctors recommended surgery. As is common with high-profile surgeries for high-profile players, Michael Thomas wanted to go and get a second opinion before immediately just going under the knife. That second opinion, that other doctor told him that he could potentially gradually come back from this with rehab. So Michael Thomas took that back to the New Orleans Saints medical staff, and together they derived and agreed upon a rehabilitation program that would allow them to track progress and then very likely at some point, if necessary, pull the trigger on the surgery that was suggested in the first place. The issue seems to be that despite phone calls from the New Orleans Saints, their medical staff, and even Sean Payton, that Michael Thomas didn't answer the phone and didn't return those calls, and therefore progress was not tracked. This is important because it wasn't until Michael Thomas came back for mandatory minis that they realized, oh, fam, the ankle's not great, so you're going to have to go get that surgery, and so he ended up not getting the surgery until June. So the brass tacks of all this is that Michael Thomas dropped the ball, but I don't want to focus on that because, let's be real, it already happened. Focusing on it, harping on it, complaining about it, talking about it isn't going to change the fact that it happened as it happened. Not a damn thing's going to change that. So what happens next becomes most important. So that's what happened. Now let's talk about what it means for the team. Basically, you've got three routes that this can go. All kind of can be mixed, mis, like kind of mixed matched as well. But basically what we understand and what Jeff Duncan reported from the sources that are familiar with the situation from inside the organization Ever since the sort of recheck happened at minis and the second suggestion for the surgery happened and then the actual surgery happened, apparently Michael Thomas has been a bit of a good sport 
about all of this and has been doing the rehabilitation, or I guess not the rehabilitation yet, but is in line to get that started, has been sort of cooperating with the organization. All the things that need to be happening so far have been happening. So if that continues to happen, you've got two outcomes that can simply come from that. He continues to be a good sport. He heals up. The Saints go out there. They win games. Everything's fine because winning cures all. The other option, he's a good sport. Things heal up. They don't win. And then you have a bit of a rift here because this isn't the first incident over the course of last year. When it comes to Michael Thomas, let's not forget or downplay the situation that happened in practice where he and CJ Gardner Johnson got into when he punched CJ Gardner Johnson in practice, right? So the reputation or the, the relationship potentially could continue to fracture here because these are now two separate isolated incidents in which Michael Thomas is kind of messed up quite a bit. And that leads me to the third outcome which is that he becomes a bad sport about this. It doesn't go well, and he doesn't keep up. And potentially in that case, if he becomes insubordinate, I guess you could say, then he doesn't finish his contract in New Orleans. There's no way. There's no way that this organization would put up with that. I mean, we've seen that in the past, right? We've seen this team not be afraid to move on from high-profile players that, you know, closed mouths don't get fed, might ring a bell, things like that, that don't really, you know, get in lockstep and buy in. And this would be an example of Michael Thomas not getting in lockstep and not buying it. I don't anticipate that happening, but it's because I don't ever really anticipate the worst case scenario. I always anticipate maybe the middle of the line, which is that there, he's a good sport about this, maybe the Saints struggle, and then there's still a potential that he doesn't finish out his contract in New Orleans, which honestly was always going to be sort of a reality anyway, moving forward, because again, high profile players at a position that the Saints don't usually pay, but they made an exception and played one of the paid one of the best wide receivers in the league. So I have no expectation out of all this outside of the fact that it sounds like he's being a good sport and I would expect that to continue to move forward. Now, how does the relationship or, or potentially even fractured relationship either get repaired or stay repaired moving forward? That will be what to track and what is just certainly unknown at this time. So again, Michael Thomas kind of dropping the ball on this in terms of the recovery, staying in touch, rehab, all of that. But the surgery is now done. Michael Thomas is apparently kind of in lockstep and things are going well. Hopefully they continue to go well. And that would certainly help to solidify his future with the New Orleans Saints. Now, speaking of future, the New Orleans Saints are trying to figure out the immediate future at some key positions on the offensive side. We're going to start with the offense, taking a look at practice days eight and nine training camp days eight and nine and what we've seen so far from players that are stepping up where the Saints need them most. We'll talk about it and compare days eight and nine up next as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. And before we get to that, I want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Built Bar, where there is no comparison. This is simply the best tasting protein bar ever, 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 ever. Best tasting one on the market. This is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. All the enjoyment and all the joy that comes from eating candy, but of course, all of the health benefits that come from eating something that's not overloading you with sugar and that is giving you the protein that you need to have the energy to get through the rest of the day. 17, 18 grams of protein, only four or five grams of sugar and fantastic flavors like coconut, coconut almond, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, as well as some fruit-based uh, uh, flavors as well like strawberry, orange, raspberry, all covered in 100% chocolate. And even though that sounds sweet, not overloading you with all of that sugar content that you get stuck with with some of these other, uh, let's just say, less good <laughs> uh, protein bars that are out on the market. So go and check them out over at built.com. Don't forget to use the promo code though, LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, so you can get 15% off of your next order of Built Bars over at built.com. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Saints. We were talking about Michael Thomas, his injury and surgery and recovery and not being available for the Saints to open up the season in the last segment. One of the reasons why that's so important is because the New Orleans Saints have several very important positions over on the offensive side they're trying to fill, and that kind of only added to the list. The top position, of course, that the New Orleans Saints are trying to fill is the quarterback position where, I have to tell you, there's still no separation here. I thought that maybe we would see it. I was there for Friday's practice, and we saw some great passes from both of these quarterbacks, particularly in the second period of team drills that they did, and both of them looked good. A lot of deep, or not say deep passes, more like intermediate area attacks, some blown coverages, some slips, things like that. A rough day for the secondary day eight, and both these quarterbacks took advantage of it in the second part of, or the second period of team drills. 
But then in the third period of team drills, we saw Taysom struggle while Jameis was efficient and was able to do uh, was able to help march the, the the team down the field, if you will, in a training camp sort of way. So I thought day eight was won by Jameis Winston. Day nine, the New Orleans Saints come back on Saturday. They got started with red zone goal line type drills. And both of these quarterbacks struggled again. And so you're still struggling to find the separation between both of them because one of them will have a good day while the other has a bad day. Then they'll both have a good day or they'll both, you know, the other will have a good day while the other has a bad day. And then they'll just both have a bad day together. And so it's really tough. It's really tough to project sort of the separation so far here throughout training camp when there's just no obvious separation at all. And there's a couple of reasons why this is important. First of all, it speaks highly of Taysom. There's a reason why this works for Jameis too. Chill out. But it speaks highly for Taysom. Taysom, what makes him special, you can't see in camp, right? You're not going to see him going out on quarterback power, running through defenders because ain't nobody tackling him and he's not running anybody over. But on the other, and so him keeping pace in just the quarterback conversation is good for Taysom. On the other hand, the thing that makes Jameis so special is his ability to be able to attack, to attack downfield, get the ball down the field, 50, 60 yards through the air, all of that. But he's not relying on that to separate himself in the midst of this competition. Instead, he's showing you that he can you know, read through his progressions, dump the ball off, make the right decision, pick up five yards instead of forcing something for 50 yards that could be taken away or go or go incomplete or even pushing to the second level. Right. And going to the intermediate area and then throwing in traffic when he's got somebody five yards underneath that's wide open. He's taking those passes. So you're seeing him run the offense, right? The New Orleans Saints love their short passing game because it's an extension of the run game, just like Taysom Hill is, but neither of them are really showing the thing at this time that separates them. That's why I think preseason games are going to become most important because in the preseason, you're going to see Taysom Hill do that thing that makes him special. And because of that, Jameis is going to look to push push the ball so that he and what makes him special doesn't get forgotten about in this conversation. So still no real separation here. Do want to say though that Ian Book looks pretty good. Not going to say at all that he's somebody that's going to get involved in this quarterback competition because he's simply not, but he's definitely the leader big time over Trevor Simeon to be the third quarterback on the roster. Okay, let's look at wide receivers real quick. We talked about Michael Thomas not being there. So who are the receivers that are standing out? Uh, Deontay Harris, first of all, looks incredible so far in camp, but they might not have him for the first couple of games of the season because of the DWI arrest. So with that being the case, you're usually looking for guys like Marquez Calloway and Traquan Smith. Trick is, Traquan Smith has now missed four straight practices. That includes through Saturday. So with that, you're really just looking at Marquez Calloway, who looks fantastic in camp, but unfortunately, neither quarterback is really standing out. So he's only able to do so much. But even with that, even with the struggles at the quarterback position so far, Marquez Calloway is looking really, really good. Jalen McCleskey has also made some big plays. He had a nice catch and run in day eight that I was uh, pretty excited to see. And you're also seeing him get work at punt returner, get work at punt gunner as well. So you're seeing him check all of the boxes that the usual wide receiver standout at camp isn't able to check in terms of the ability to be multiple and contribute from a bunch of different places. And the veteran Chris Hogan, who, by the way, is 6'1", just over 200 pounds. He runs a similar route tree to which you would get with Michael Thomas. Not saying, and I want to back up Matty Hudak on this one, not saying that he's going to be somebody that is going to make you forget Michael Thomas isn't available. There's no such thing as that. But if they need somebody to run the route tree, just like Traquan Smith did last season, and they want a veteran guy that can do that, Chris Hogan can do that. The trick about Chris Hogan, though, is that he's over the age of 30, I believe he's 33, 34 years old. So he's not going to contribute in special teams. He's just not going to do that. So if he's going to make the roster, he's got to do it at one, two, or three. So depending upon how much longer Traquan Smith is out, there could be an opportunity for Chris Hogan to solidify that for himself. But we just don't know that yet until we see what happens when and if Traquan Smith makes his way back. When it comes to day nine, both Chris Hogan and Marquez Calloway continued to stand out in red zone drills on Saturday when given opportunities. And finally, want to give you some updates at the tight end position as well. Uh, on day eight, Nick Vanette was out actually for a couple of days with the flu, not uh, not that other thing. It was the flu. Uh, Ethan Wolf has been out with an ankle injury, will be out for up to a week, maybe a little bit longer. In his stead, the New Orleans Saints signed Doug Peterson's son former Philadelphia Eagles coach Josh Peterson, who of course played at ULM up in Monroe, uh, six foot five, 235 pounds, caught 99 catches over the course of his career, 1,191 yards and 11 touchdowns, had a great season his sophomore year back in 2019, where he caught uh, several receptions for 567 yards and nine touchdowns 
in that single season. Stop me if you've heard this before, though. The one thing he's going to have to do is step up his blocking at the next level. Obviously, the Saints have done a good job with that uh, over the course of you can look at guys like Adam Trotman, so on and so forth. When it comes to making the roster spot available for him, Ryan Glasgow, defensive tackle, retired. He's going to go back to school and get his master's degree. That was announced on Saturday. Sean Payton has known about this since last week, talked about it, or last weekend, talked about it a bit in his Saturday post-practice presser, and everyone wishes him well. And Adam Troutman looks really, really good. He caught a very nice pass from Jameis Winston in day eight over the seam. You'll love to hear it. And you had in day nine, Nick Vanette return. So you're looking forward to seeing Nick Vanette continue to get some work. And as I mentioned in the other, uh, in I think it was Friday's episode, right? Yeah, Friday's episode, Juwan Johnson continues to stand out at the position as well. So a really interesting one to watch. Still a lot of unanswered questions, but that's just an update in terms of what changes have been made and how those players are performing so far. No big changes on the offensive line right now. A couple of guys are struggling, like Kyle Turner, for instance, but you add J.R. Sweezy and your starters are looking great, but they're still taking some punishment from a defensive line that's been incredibly effective. We're going to go over to that defense next. It's looked really good in camp over these last couple of days. We'll talk about that as we wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Let's get it. Houdat Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints, our bonus Saturday episode here to get you caught up on days eight and nine at camp. Again, highlighting and focusing on positions of need for the New Orleans Saints. So we're going to start over on the defensive side. I want to jump straight to cornerback, though, and it will build over to defensive line, where I think the defensive line for the New Orleans Saints has been the best performing unit so far throughout training camp from what I've seen. But I want to start with the cornerbacks. In day eight, some guys that stood out, Paul Sinadibo and Ken Crawley. Uh, Robinson had a fall at one point, which led to a big catch and run by Marquez Calloway, who again continues to look really good. Uh, you also saw Crawley in coverage in a big catch by Jalen McCleskey, but he gave up his first catch in one-on-ones on Friday's practice and continues to look really good. Paul Sinadibo continues to get first team snaps opposite Marshawn Lattimore, but also continues to get second team snaps in place of Marshawn Lattimore at the right cornerback position and continues to get snaps in the slot as well, even being used as a blitzer off the edge a la CJ Gardner Johnson. So they're really deploying Paulson Adebo and getting a look at him in a bunch of different places. But it is notable to say that he has been getting those second team snaps behind Marshawn Lattimore. That could become important if Marshawn Lattimore does indeed end up with a suspension to open up the 2021 season. On Saturday's practice in those red zone drills, two cornerbacks ended up with interceptions. You got one from a recent signing, Adonis Alexander, who came in once Keith Washington was moved to injured reserve with his injury. And you got another from CJ Gardner Johnson, which looked like it would have been housed as well. Those interceptions coming off of Jameis Winston, who's thrown two interceptions. The same number as Taysom Hill so far, and then Ian Book, who's also thrown a couple of interceptions as well. All right, let's take a look at the linebackers so far. The guy that's got maybe the most interceptions so far during camp, pretty sure it's Zach Mon, who's looked really good over the last uh, couple uh, or last week, I'll say last couple of practices. Uh, so Zach Vaughn had an interception in day eight on Taysom Hill, a bobbled reception that he was able to snag away. Uh, on that play, it seemed likely that Taysom Hill would have been sacked in the pocket anyway, but still, regardless, they played through and uh, Zach Bond made a nice play there. The young linebackers continue to step up, including Zach Bond, but also Pete Werner. Chase Hansen as a blitzer has been really fun to watch. He ended up blowing up Stevie Scott in day nine. Uh, he said after practice that he thought that Stevie that it was going to be a run play. And sometimes it just works out like that. And so he kind of hit Stevie Scott as if it were a run play, but instead ended up bowling through him uh, when it came to pass protection. We've seen Chase Hansen do something of that like uh, pretty similarly. But I will say that he got stonewalled by Alvin Kamara. No, he got stonewalled by Latavius Murray on one instance. Alvin Kamara stonewalled Caden Ellis. At another instance, Caden Ellis continues to look like somebody that can play sideline to sideline and has looked really good. And you've also seen a young linebacker in Andrew Dowell who continues to get into the backfield and make plays in the passing and run games as well. Quan Alexander, though, of course, still looming, hasn't fully participated in practice, but you've seen him getting some conditioning work in at each of these practices. Does say that he feels 100% and stop me if you've heard this before, says he feels better than he did before the surgery, better than he did before the injury. But there does seem to be a lot of confidence around his ability to be able to recover and be ready to get started uh, as soon as he can and contribute for this defense. 
Don't know if he's going to be ready to kick off the season, but as soon as he's ready, it seems that he will be impactful if nothing else. On day nine Saturday, just want to give a quick shout out to Pete Werner, who was noted as being very active in the run game. He and Peyton Turner apparently making a couple of nice stops together, which brings us to the defensive line. And I have several names of standouts of the courses of days eight and nine there. Peyton Turner, Marcus Davenport, Carl Granderson, and then even guys like Tano Passanio and Cam Jordan continue to shine. I'm telling you, this defensive line, just like I said when we let off this segment, has been the best unit for the New Orleans Saints so far. And you've seen it actually on the defensive line and the offensive line. And I understand that sounds weird, but you want both of them to continue to get the equal amount of wins. And that's really what you've seen, defensive line and offensive line. But maybe day nine was a bit of a separation there to where the defensive line just went absolutely nuts. You saw Jalen Dalton get an interception during walkthroughs, which he high-stepped down the sideline uh, for, according to Amy Just over at NOLA.com. And then you've seen Christian Ringo of uh, UL continue to stand out as well out of Louisiana. He has made some great plays, and he had another big day, day nine. We saw him make some big plays in day eight as well. You've also seen uh, Peyton Turner and Carl Granderson just continue to step up multiple sacks each practice, sometimes from these guys. Noah Spence getting involved in the sack count as well, and uh, Marcus Davenport looking really good. And of course, as I mentioned before, uh, my, uh, Cam Jordan, almost at Michael Jordan, Cam Jordan, despite the fact that he's getting consistent rest, continues to look consistent as well when he's out on the field. This pass rush looks like it can be very, very good to get started here throughout camp. Now we'll see if, they tra- if they're able to translate it into game action. And certainly that would all start with the preseason, which believe it or not, y'all, when the Saints are back to practice on Monday, remember they're going to take Sunday off. When they're back to practice on Monday, it's game prep week. The Saints' first preseason game is next weekend, which is kind of wild to be traveling to Baltimore to take on the Baltimore Ravens. So with that, as we return for our Monday episode, remember this is a bonus episode for you, we return on Monday for our next episode. We're going to start to look ahead. Who are the players that have the ability to stand out once they get into full speed action? Where do you hope to see the separation continue outside of, of course, the quarterback position? We're going to be able to break all that down, get some folks in to update us on camp and prep week. It's going to be a lot of fun in this upcoming week of Locked on Saints. So make sure you're here with us Monday through Friday and sometimes even more here on Locked on Saints as we continue to keep you up to date with your New Orleans Saints. As always, y'all, everything in between you can find with me over on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them trust you that nation. I'll holla at you.